Hi, I'm Chris Roberts. Ever since I saw Star Wars as a wide-eyed eight-year-old, I dreamt of being a hotshot pilot saving the galaxy or a lovable rogue making my way across the cosmos. Star Citizen has a very long public history. While it's true that most games don't get announced as early as Star Citizen, there have also been big mistakes, mismanagement, and issues with development along the way. This isn't a secret, and it isn't new. Games see major issues throughout development constantly. Sometimes we don't learn about them until after release, and sometimes we never actually hear what went wrong. But when your entire funding and development model is based on almost limitless information and open development, that's just something you have to deal with. Right now, I believe Star Citizen is entering a new stage of development with a lot more player-facing improvement. And I'd like to explain this opinion by looking at the history of the making and how the focus is beginning to change again. Thank you for coming to My Tomato Talk. And thanks to my newest supporter, Nicola. The beginning of it all, 2012. At this stage, Star Citizen had a solid idea of what it was supposed to be. The studio had supposedly completed pre-production and had some functioning assets that were used to sell the vision. That certainly helps and possibly was true at the time, but as we'll see later on, this didn't help in the long run, well, besides the money part. I consider this phase one. This was deep into crowdfunding, when players were excited for what was being proposed. Kickstarter games were still a commonly supported thing, space sims were slowly making a comeback. The excitement and idea and all this anticipation made for the perfect timing to launch such a project. The studio was much smaller at this point. The company consisted of anywhere from about 53 to 100 employees. A large team, but certainly not everybody that would be needed. Hiring picked up as more money was brought in, leading to about eight years later when Cloud Imperium would have over 700 employees in five studios across four countries, with a brand new as of Spring 21 studio dedicated to creating new locations in Montreal. It's a lot of effort, and back in Phase 1, not many people were expecting the marathon it might turn into. This lengthy cycle would become more clear though with one key decision. As the funding reached a point at which CIG realized the game was fully funded without private investors, they presented the community with a decision. Take what's there and make a game or expand the game and continue to please every single space nerd desire you could think of. It was a big moment for the game, and 88% of present space nerds wanted more space. Wow. This doesn't happen with anything in the player base, really. Most polls are fairly divided in their results. Regardless, the path forward was clear, and a new phase began. While Phase 1 was about expanding the studio, building the company and funding the project, Phase 2 was much more focused on actually building the game. It was also, in my opinion, the time most beset with problems. See, the game was being released in modules as they were becoming available. While the hangar module was released in 2013, allowing you to see your ship outside and sometimes in, Arena Commander, a more arcade-like dogfighting simulator, would not launch until summer of 2014. The reason for this simulator was so that players could test the fighting mechanics and provide feedback to CIG. Enemy knight down. Stand by. Scanning. This was around the time I joined the project, but as many of you know, I actually didn't really pay much attention until 2017 or so. This, I'm sure, is the situation many of you are in while watching this video. During this phase, many things happened. CIG had outsourced work to several contractors, including a company named Ilphonic, who would handle Star Marine, the FPS version of Arena Commander, essentially. Due to miscommunication or whatever the issue may have been, the work was not compatible with what CIG had planned. I can't confirm if this is fact, but have seen it alluded to. It's unfortunate and something I've heard of happening before, but it has certainly remained something that continues to linger on some players' minds. 
This was when quite a bit of negativity began to form around the project, in big part due to the parallel development of Squadron 42, the single player story that would be created alongside Star Citizen. Squadron 42 was given solid release dates, the first having been missed in 2014, and then changed to 2016. The failure to deliver Squadron 42 this initial time, and as you'll see twice more, weighed on the reputation of the more commonly known Star Citizen. And that's a very important point. While this isn't a video about the full drama of the project or development, it is necessary to acknowledge the large amount of poor decisions that added additional time to the process. But maybe not to dwell on them to the point of obsession. The Persistent Universe first launched in 2015 one year after Star Citizen was meant to release. Keep in mind, after this point, there were no more release dates for Star Citizen, only Squadron 42. While I wasn't following closely, this was the first time I jumped into the game, and the first time you could really experience anything like a space sim. However, it was incredibly bare bones, and it was cool for about half an hour, and then just boring. Every single system in the game was in flux, and many were unstable. Stretch goals had wildly expanded the scope, Engineering and design documents were being released, but many of those aspects were years and years off. Ships were being sold without actually being in the game, and towards 2016 and 2017, backers were all but shuttered from in-game updates. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. In 2015, planets were announced, again shifting the idea of what the game would be. This had two effects, it informed everybody that this game would still be a ways off. With the original goal of 100 star systems, as I'm sure many of you have heard of, things were clearly not going to be what they once were. Explorable landing zones, the ability to fly to and from planetary surfaces and explore every inch of the terrain, and the idea of outposts, colonies, cities, and countless other additions were all unannounced complications that come with something like planets. This excited many, including myself, while others saw the writing on the wall. Only in 2020 was the engine crafted well enough to feature arguably the best built planets in gaming. A key milestone, but it took time. While the game is taking a long time to build, this is essentially due to how much work it is to recreate the game engine. While the game is run on a version of Lumberyard which was derived from the CryEngine, it has been vastly changed in many ways running entirely different from a game like New World, another Lumberyard title. I can't stress enough how many custom tools and proprietary programs have been built into the engine to complete the goals of what Cloud Imperium are shooting for. Around this period of 2015 to 2017, many of the needed systems to run the game in the desired manner were being announced and planned for. And then we entered what I like to call the Great Drought. Star Citizen 3.0 was meant to be the new springboard patch for the game to get back on track. Many, myself included, looked at 3.0 as the initial developmental version of what Star Citizen was going to be after the bloat and scope increase had initially subsided. Mostly. The update was announced to release in December of 2016. However, after what can only be called gross incompetence or lying, the patch was finally announced to not be happening at the proper time. Instead, backers were treated to weekly updates showing an absolute ton of development going on behind the scenes, and a weekly burndown showing how many issues needed to be completed before launching the update. In this time, we learned of many of the pieces of technology that would be needed for the game to run. This included 64-bit precision implemented in 2015, network bind culling in 2018, serialized variables in 2018, item system 2.0 which has been ongoing, client-side object container streaming in 2018, server-side object container streaming in 2019, the iCache system in 2021, a massive physics rework in 2020, and server meshing still being constructed. We will touch on these later, but you can imagine what it was like to see these necessary technologies for the network side of the game and not really understanding how long they might take. Some of them, like object container streaming, were new systems, while others, like iCache and Item System 2.0, were complete fundamental rewrites of major parts of the engine that have taken years to complete. 
Come December of 2017, after over six months of zero updates and the 3.0 patch was released as Phase 2 came to an end. Squadron 42 had missed three release deadlines, and the studio decided to take the safer approach, removing any dates and simply showcasing the latest info. This period, Phase 2, while increasing the scale of the game to something I could actually see myself playing for a decade plus, was also filled with missteps, mismanagements, and a pretty bad record on communication. While it was frustrating, as somebody who follows a lot of things, it wasn't actually that noticeable. But for many, this phase was enough to say, never again. As the third phase of development began in January of 2018, things were off to a rough start. Technologies were being pushed back and the game with its newly added assets and features was not running very well. And we were realizing just how many reworks all the old assets would need to be up to standard with the new game. That being said, the community was enthusiastic, funding was still chugging, and a lot of great things were being worked on. The roadmap was filled with exciting professions and some very interesting topics that were going to greatly expand the game. Then the feature delays started. Throughout 2018 and 2019, these delays came to define the meta of Star Citizen development. While meaningful features were being added, such as UI changes, multiplayer improvements, new missions and the first planet, major professions such as salvage and repair and features like atmospheric flying NPCs and true ship degradation were pushed back over and over. It was rough, but things like the mining profession, quality of life improvements, bounty hunting, various new planets and areas to land at, new flight models, and more were adding to make the game more enjoyable anyways. It was about the priorities. And the big additions of object container streaming and item system 2.0 refactors also made the game much more enjoyable, boosting the average FPS up into the 30s and 40s for most players. While still filled with those mistakes, missteps, and poor decisions, such as trying to charge for the ability to stream their convention and failing to properly communicate their motives, this period of development from 2018 to 2020 did a lot to bring in new players and really solidify the direction of the game. Much of the groundwork for the game was laid at this time. The planetary technology was finalized, the dynamic economic system began to take shape, live events began to take place in the game, stability improved bit by bit, and some serious milestones were laid out that finally felt within reach to those who followed the development closely. As 2020 came to a close, I started to notice a bit of a shift in the development of the game. The additions that were being discussed and even added were less the type of updates that affect the game one to two years later and more the type of things that players will notice as soon as they enter the game. Things like new maps for FPS, ship and scanning purposes, new professions popping back up such as salvage, medical and hacking. Forward facing improvements were back on the table in a big way and quality of life was becoming much more important in the studio. It's now 2021. The first patch of the year is out with a small patch coming soon featuring new vehicles, cargo improvements, and more. And the next major patch, despite the inevitable delays, boasts to bring some serious additions to the game. And the rest of the year is looking promising as well, with a newly detailed roadmap sharing many of the small and large changes in development, team by team, feature by feature, for any single player to actively track and understand what things may be receiving work right now, and stop wondering whether or not things are actually being done. Seriously, go check it out. Please check it out. It's in the description below, and I feel people could benefit from getting some context. Anyways, one might ask how I can feel positive about this new period after so many years of difficulty. For one, I've skipped many of the small things throughout these years that kept the project positive and growing. While the game itself has struggled, the opportunities it has provided in its janky state for the people who play have been pretty amazing. And that's part of what keeps me, the possibility that I can have those moments with a game like what Star Citizen plans to be wrapped around them. That being said, I've tried to take a more neutral stance for most of this video. 
and I've also been following this very closely since late 2017 now. And while I've been wrong about a few things, I've seen what they've needed to work on and how it's been progressing, triggering other developments. If Phase 1 was growth, Phase 2 was bluster, and Phase 3 was the foundation and a bit of a reset, then in my mind this new phase is about delivery of the meat of the game. The true development of what we will be playing, or a repeat of Phase 2. God, I hope not. All those technologies we touched on back in 2016, well, they're almost all complete or well into development. The engine is finally beginning to receive its buttons and zippers, and attention is turning towards more meaningful changes from a player's perspective. Let's look at some of the additions that may be implemented this year. Missiles and torpedoes are finally seeing their conversion to item 2.0 the rework we know started in 2016. Since then, ships, armor, FPS weapons, and components have been moved to the system as well. Missiles are close to, if not the last item, to receive the complete overhaul, I believe. Ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-station docking are a massive undertaking that we've all wanted for years and years now, which wasn't possible until the physics refactor and the interaction of physics grids were all but finished. That is now possible, and I even talk in depth about the process it took to get here, in another video which you can find below. Professions such as salvage or repair were not possible until the iCash system was finished, which is happening right now in the first half of 2021. That also goes for ship state and status, true persistent mining deposits, the ability to save locations, a fully physicalized and interactable cargo system, and many other small additions that rely on item tracking. The medical profession needed a built-out player status system which was not implemented until 2020, and is being further improved in 2021. Physical lockers and inventories were, again, reliant on iCash, along with the ability to name your ship, in my opinion. Exploration as a gameplay element needed improved scanning and radar to be viable, something now being worked on and planned for this summer. You can see my recent video on the topic in the video description below. The creation of the cutting tool leads a straight path to salvage gameplay planned for this fall. Hacking is due for this year, and the engineering profession has already been shown off in a basic design overview. Batteries, capacitors, and charging capabilities will allow for ships, weapons, and other items to react to power systems and the parts that need to go inside of them to function. Security systems aim to build out both piracy and bounty hunting, while adding an in-game method of controlling player actions and relaying information to the proper parties. UIs are due for a rather large update. The new planet tech is allowing the creation of rock arches, massive caves, and rivers. A reputation system that is now usable ties our mission history, current standing with the law, and other personal decisions into dynamic live events that now draw players in multiple times every year to work together towards a common goal, sometimes against one another. I could keep going, but almost every improvement made this year will have an immediate and noticeable effect on most players in the game. All of these changes point towards a time of development when the cylinders are firing in the name of completing an actual functioning game, which can be played full time. While this doesn't mean the game is anywhere near ready for a commercial launch, I would place the 2021 version of Star Citizen solid in the middle of an early access cycle. Good enough to enjoy in several different ways, especially with friends, but not quite stable enough for a casual player to make their main game. And I'd like to repeat that. Just like the annual video I put out at the beginning of the year to show viewers what the state of the game looks like, and just like every monthly progress report and quarterly update review I put out about the game, I do not believe the game is ready for everybody, but it is in a place where I think it's worth watching closely, as many things are beginning to come together. You can find my current opinion on whether you should play the game or not, on my most recent update review, which you can find in the playlist down below. Star Citizen still has some pretty big challenges to surpass, coming up with several new star systems in the same amount of years if not faster, finding a way for the whole globe to play together in a seamless environment, ridding itself of the weird reputation of being a scam, which I actually don't think is that important, figuring out a way to not have to rework everything all the time every year, building out the professions so that players never grow tired of them, and continuing to foster a friendly environment for newcomers. These are all challenges that could cause trouble, but I've never felt better than the current state of development, especially not in the last couple years. And I think this new period of development in Star Citizen is going to truly push the game into a new light, 
and as the game grows, the community will as well. And maintaining a balanced outlook about something you like so much is as important to the health of the project as it is to the newcomers of the game. Continue to foster the same friendly community that helped me fall in love with the project and start my own in-game organization, which you can join in the video description. And don't hesitate to call out those who tend to be a bit more aggressive. Let's maintain the same growth as a community that the project does and hope that we can all improve. Because I think with the right community around it and the right studio developing it, in this new phase of development, Star Citizen could progress into a very interesting and fun game to play. This is a video I've wanted to make for a while, and I honestly didn't know how it was going to go until I just sat down and started writing. While there are many aspects of the development I've skipped, I believe this can provide the context somebody might need to understand my optimism for the next couple of years in Star Citizen. And I hope it can show existing backers why 2021 may actually be a great year, and the start of something much better despite what some in the community believe. Thanks for taking the time to watch this whole video, if you've made it this far, and please let me know in the comments below, in my Twitch stream, in Discord, on Twitter, wherever you might find me, what you thought of this video, if you want to see more like it, and if this topic really interested you, and if this opinion resonated with you at all. I'd also really appreciate if you subscribed and stuck around for more of my Star Citizen coverage and the skits and gameplay I aim to show off as we progress. You can also support me on Patreon if you'd like to help me continue to make content like this. And you can catch me live discussing and playing Star Citizen as well as many other games over on Twitch. In fact, head over to my gaming community on Discord where we can play all those games together and make new friends. And don't forget to check out my new podcast coming up shortly. You'll see posts about that in the near future. Thanks again for dropping by, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks to my top supporters, TK, Valiant15, Ben N, The Alpaca, The Huntress, Holston Coop, Falcus Vipus, Dasek, Guilty Conscious, and Extreme Tuber 7. 